Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, today our speaker is Jose Maria Bermudo. Uh, he did uh, his bachelor's and master's degree in telecommunication engineering, engineering at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid in Spain. And right after that, he joined the Technical University of Munich as research assistant to work on implementations of post-quantum crypto. He is now a PhD student at COSIP Group in KU Leuven, uh, where he has focused on lattice-based schemes. He's also part of the Sabre team, one of the finalists in the post-quantum cryptography competition Denis is running. And his main interests are crypto, embedded systems, and digital design. Today, he's gonna talk about uh, different implementation aspects of uh, lattice-based crypto, which is uh, uh, one of his uh, specialities. And uh, before starting with the talk, I would like to remember the audience the, that we have a Q&A chat where you can write your questions to the speaker. He will try to answer them either during the talk, and if there is no time, uh, he will have a look at the end. Um, yeah, uh, that was uh, all I had to say. Uh, Jose, the stage is yours. Um, thank you, Santos, and also uh, thank you to the uh, Technology Innovation Institute for the invitation to give this seminar. Um, yes, uh, was already introduced. Uh, the title of my talk is Implementation Aspects of Lattice-Based Cryptography. And during my talk, um, I will first into the, in, introduce uh, the motivation uh, behind uh, this topic and why I chose it for the talk. Uh, then I will introduce the lattice problems and how they are using cryptography. I will uh, talk about the implementation challenges when we want to implement lattice-based uh, schemes. And then for the most part of the talk, I will focus on the implementation of the post-quantum chem saber um, because it's also a, the work I have developed throughout my PhD. And I will finish with a conclusion and some future research lines that uh, anyone can follow when uh, doing research on, on cryptography on, and lattice space in particular. <clears throat> so um, first, um, why I talk about implementation aspects and not on cryptography, uh, of cryptography more in general is, uh, we have here um, a picture that shows the typical design flow when you want to design a new cryptographic algorithm. First, you have, um, let's say, a theoretical stage uh, where mat usually mathematicians, cryptographers design algorithms. They uh, perform crypto analysis on these algorithms and they have a feedback loop uh, that serves to determine whether a scheme is secure or not. And uh, out of this cryptanalysis process, they come out with parameters. And once you have a design of a scheme and the parameters, you can go through to the implementation. But then we have the implementation aspects of the practical research that consists of how to choose these parameters. And then uh, when we implement a scheme, we can also get feedback back to the designers to modify the scheme or to choose new parameters so that we can have uh, more efficient schemes. And, and then uh, we have um, not only optimized implementations, but we also have uh, another loop uh, uh, where we uh, attack the algorithm, not with script analysis, but with side channel analysis techniques. And we propose countermeasures to these attacks. So uh, my research has been focused on, on this part of the design process. And uh, I will now introduce that uh, in the field of lattice-based cryptography. But first of all, what is lattice-based cryptography? Uh, well, we have um, the existing public key schemes, RSA, elliptic curve, uh, digital signatures, that are based on number theoretical problems, such as the prime factorization or the discrete algorithm. And the problem of these algorithms is that once we will have a quantum computer large enough to run the Schorz algorithm for the dimensions of these problems, we will be able to break these schemes. And to anticipate this threat, uh, NIST, which is the um, National Institute of Standards and Te uh, Technology of the United States, uh, um, has announced a competition for the standardization uh, of post-quantum cryptography. And we know that the fact of uh, the standards of NIST will become the global standards. Um, and uh, in the first uh, call for proposals of this uh, contest, 
we had um, different uh, candidates for signatures or key encapsulation mechanisms of different uh, types, lattice-based, code-based, multivariate, hash-based, or other constructions. And <clears throat> NIST has gone already through the first three phases of this contest and has uh, used um, security and efficiency as the main criteria to select algorithms. And in July 2020, uh, they announced already the finalists of this standardization contest. And we can see there are four finalists in uh, the category of key encapsulation mechanism and three in the category of signatures. But uh, among these uh, seven finalists, five of them are lattice-based schemes. So lattice-based is the most promising solution for post-quantum cryptography. So now I'm going to introduce uh, lattice-based cryptography. And lattice-based uh, lattices are, uh, the use of lattices in cryptography is a very recent development. Uh, it comes from the early 2000s, and there's not only research on how to build uh, key encapsulation mechanisms and uh, digital signatures, but there are also novel constructions such as homomorphic encryption, functional encryption. Uh, they are used in multi-party computation as well. And there is also research in implementation aspects on how to make them efficient and secure. And uh, yeah, uh, this I already mentioned, they are resistant against post-quantum attacks. So they are one of the favorites for uh, post-quantum cryptography. And this is why I chose for this uh, talk to talk about implementation aspects of lattice-based cryptography. So now I'm going to introduce what are lattice problems. Um, so if we start from a linear system of equations, we have a public matrix A and a secret S, and then we build samples that uh, combine this public matrix with the secret. And if we would want to build a crypto system out of it, it would not be secure because we can get the secret simply by solving this linear system. We know the matrix A and we know the sample B. However, when we introduce a er an error term uh, to this equation, we don't have a linear system anymore. And uh, if the dimension of the matrix and the vector is large enough, uh, then we have the learning with error problems. We have a hard problem. And with a hard problem, we can build a crypto system. Uh, so when we want to implement a crypto system based on learning with errors, um, we have to implement these four, uh, these four operations. One is um, the generation of the public matrix A, the generation of the secret, the generation of the error term that we are adding, and then we have to perform the arithmetic, uh, but the matrix vector multiplication will of course be the bottleneck operation. There is also the addition of the error. And, um, when we look at this, we are looking at the theoretical, uh, we're looking at the crypto system from the theoretical point of view. And we can already uh, improve the efficiency of the scheme at this stage by, for instance, uh, sampling the public matrix as a polynomial. And then we would build the matrix as with the rotations of these polynomials. And or another way to see it in practice is that we don't have a public matrix, we have a simply a polynomial. And then the main operation is a convolution with the secret. Uh, this variant of learning with errors is called ring learning with errors, and it improves a lot the efficiency of the schemes. Uh, this way we are optimizing the sampling of A, but also the arithmetic, the matrix vector uh, product. But we still have the, the, sam the sampling process of the error in this case. And another improvement we can do on learning with errors is to introduce the error term, not by sampling the error and adding it to the sample, but by a rounding operation. And then the error is the uh, is inherent to the rounding operation. And this variant is called learning with rounding. And of course the ring version and the learning with rounding version, they can be combined. So we could have a ring learning with rounding scheme. But um, there were some concerns about the security of the ring version as compared to the standard lattice version. And that's how uh, the third variant, which is the module uh, learning with errors of module learning with rounding was born. And in this variant, uh, we have a public matrix again, but um, the elements of this public matrix are uh, polynomials. So the dimension of the matrix, this L is much smaller as in the case of a standard uh, lattice-based cryptography. Uh, but then we have uh, polynomials that of course, uh, whose length is 
is more than in the green case. So the module lattices are a solution that lies in between uh, standard lattices and ideal lattices in, in between learning with errors and green learning with errors. And um, here I have a, a diagram that shows that the error is added, but we can combine module lattices also with the learning with rounding problem. So we could add uh, the error by a round operation. And <clears throat> If we move now to, to a more practical point of view, uh, we have um, three operation, main operations that have to be implemented. So we don't look as at the schemas uh, sampling A, S, uh, and the error and generating the sample, but we look at it as we have to perform uh, pseudo random number generation, and we use these pseudo random numbers to generate A, S, and E. Then we need to uh, sample. Uh, in this case, the secret and the error, because the public matrix is normally sample uniform because it's public anyway. But uh, for the secret and the errors, we normally use uh, different distributions, uh, the binomial distribution or the Gaussian discrete Gaussian distribution. So we need to uh, sample elements following a particular distribution. And then we have the polynomial multiplication or matrix vector multiplication. That will be also one of the bottleneck operations in the scheme. And then there are other operations that are have to be performed that they are involved in coding, packing, rounding operations in the case of learning with rounding, but uh, they are not the bottleneck of the schemes when we want to implement them. So if we want to make them efficient, we have to take care of these three main operations. So we are going to first look at the pseudo random number generation. And for the pseudo random number generation, we start with a truly random sample seed. And uh, this seed is then expanded using a deterministic random number generation generator. And uh, in the schemes we know, and this pseudo random uh, number generator can be built using an extendable output function. And typically, uh, a lot of schemes use Shake 128 from the Ketchak suite. But uh, we could build this uh, pseudo random number generator also using AES in counter mode or some other symmetric key based constructions or a stream based. Uh, stream cipher based constructions and there are also a couple of schemes that use HHA20 but we could use another one. So it is actually an open research area how to build these uh, random number generators uh, and uh, in this case it's not at implementation level because we already know uh, uh, how to implement symmetric key primitives, stream ciphers, and hash functions but uh, this is at design level because we can take advantage of the fact that uh, the um, security requirements for this random number generator are always not as strict as the requirements for a hash function or for a symmetric cipher. And uh, we can use this to improve the efficiency or to get uh, uh, simple design, simpler designs. Then the other operation I was mentioning before is uh, sampling from a uniform distribution. Uh, sorry, from a particular distribution. And the distributions that are typically used in lattice-based cryptography are, are the uniform distribution, the discrete binomial distribution, and the discrete sampling distribution. Uh, the uniform sampling is just the sam sampling from the uh, pseudo random number, is the output of the pseudo random number generator. Uh, and then the binomial sampling is also uh, trivial to implement as we just need to combine some samples from a uniform distribution. But the Gaussian sampling is uh, quite challenging. And it is not only challenging to make it efficient, but also secure and constant time. And uh, we know there are several methods in the literature. There are uh, methods based on floating point operations, where the probability of uh, the sample is uh, computed, and then the sample is accepted or rejected. These are rejection sampling or secret sampling, which is an improved version of the rejection sampling. We have also a method that avoids using floating point operations by starting from a base Gaussian distribution and performing a bit, uh, bit level operations, which is the Bernoulli sampling. And then we have also methods that are based on tables. So we first build a probability table, and, and then we do a random walk through this table. And examples of these sampling samplers are new jaws or uh, CDT based uh, sampling. And as I said, the, the open research area here is to make uh, efficient implementations and secure implementations. And in the case of uh, binomial sampling, which is used for sampling the secrets in many uh, lattice-based schemes, to uh, make 
uh, secure uh, samplers, and by secure, I mean it's uh, challenging to mask binomial samplers, so to protect them against physical attacks and against other attacks other than uh, theoretical attacks. And finally, I go into uh, polynomial multiplication, and I will uh, stop here a bit more because I will use it uh, more afterwards when I will talk about server implementation. So we know that the, the polynomial multiplication, if we implement it using uh, the typical representation of the polynomial, so that this polynomial is in their coefficient form, uh, we have um, here in this picture a, a schoolbook algorithm for the uh, polynomial multiplication. And the problem of this algorithm is that it has a quadratic complexity. And for the dimensions that, of the, that are typically used in the lattice-based schemes, this uh, gives a poor uh, performance. So a way to improve the efficiency of the multiplication is to use uh, the polynomials in their point value representation rather than their coefficient representation. Uh, so this way we start from, from a polynomial represented by, by its coefficients. We perform an evaluation phase, a change of the domain. And then when we have a point value uh, a representation, the product of two polynomials in the point value domain is a, a linear operation. Uh, we just need to multiply the, the values and the point remains the same. And then we have to perform uh, the inverse step of the evaluation, the interpolation or the reverse transformation to go back to the coefficient form multiplication, uh, coefficient form representation. And uh, when we use a point value representation of the polynomials, the complexity of the polynomial multiplication becomes the complexity of the evaluation and interpolation routines. Uh, because uh, they will have a higher complexity than the linear complexity of the multiplication itself. And there are uh, different um, methods uh, for performing this uh, domain change. The most popular ones are the entity uh, Karatsuba and Tumpu. Uh, the entity is the most efficient one in, one in terms of uh, complexity. It has a, a n log n complexity, but it sets some requirements to the parameters um, of the scheme and uh, to the parameters of the polynomials. Uh, and particularly, we require the arithmetic operations to be uh, um, modular arithmetic with respect to a prime modulus. And um, also, this prime modulus has to be co-prime with the two times the length of the polynomial. And this is because uh, the entity is a um, um, variant of the Fourier transform where we only need um, integral arithmetic where the roots of unity of the Fourier transform are all integers and uh, if they meet these requirements. And then we have uh, Karatsuba and Karatsuba has a uh, complexity which is better than the quadratic complexity uh, uh, and it imposes no restrictions on the uh, parameters of the scheme. Um, and how Karatsuba works is that it uh, recursively, another way to see Karatsuba is that it recursively halves the polynomial length. And uh, we go from performing a multiplication of, let's say, 256 coefficients to perform three uh, multiplications of polynomials with uh, 128 coefficients. And we can apply this algorithm recursively uh, to halve the, the length of the polynomials until we get to um, length, which is short enough to implement the multiplication efficiently. And uh, then we have Tumku, which is a generalization of Karatsuba, where we don't halve the um, polynomials, but we divide it uh, in uh, k chunks for Tumku k way. Uh, popular solutions are Tumku 3 or Tumku 4. And Tumku is also an algorithm that can be applied uh, recursively. So if now go apply this uh, to a concrete case, it's where I will uh, introduce Saber. Saber, uh, um, as I already mentioned, is one of the NIST uh, post-quantum cryptography finalists in the category of key encapsulation mechanism. Uh, Saber is based on module learning with rounding problem, um, which offers more trust than uh, the ring variants of lattice problems, but is more efficient than the uh, standard uh, uh, lattice problems. The security of the module lattice uh, schemes uh, can be adjusted by modifying only the dimension of the matrix. So we can have the same construction and we only 
increase or decrease the number of polynomials in the public matrix and the secret vector. And uh, this way we can adjust the scale up or down the security. And we have here, um, when we have a dimension three, uh, the case for Sabre, but Sabre has also a lightweight version with the dimension two and a high security version with dimension four. And in the case of Sabre, as it is uh, the rounding variant of the learning with errors, uh, the noise is introduced by the rounding operation. We don't need to sample the error. And also the design decision of Sabre was to choose the moduli as powers of two. So the rounding operation is very straightforward because it, imp it implies only uh, masking or bitwise operation. Um, so when we want to um, optimize Sabre, the first thing we have to notice is that since the moduli are powers of two, we cannot use the entity. So we have to use this uh, Tumbu and Karatsuba methods. And here I'm going to introduce the, the first uh, of my papers uh, as COSIC uh, a PhD student, which is a joint work with uh, Anshuman, uh, Suryoy, and Ingrid. This paper was published in uh, Chess uh, 2018, and it is Saber or ARM, uh, CCA Secure Model Lattice Based Key Encapsulation on ARM. And it's basically an embedded implementation of Saber, um, optimized for performance in a and the Cortex-M4 processor and optimized for memory in the Cortex-M0, which is uh, the lowest end processor by ARM. For the implementation in the Cortex-M4, we determine uh, which was the optimal uh, multiplication algorithm, which was a combination of Tunkup 4, then Karatsuba, and then the Unroll schoolbook. And we, use, uh, we took advantage of the DSP instructions that are uh, uh, supported by the Cortex-M4 architecture. Uh, whereas for the memory optimized implementation, uh, we used, we introduced a memory efficient version of Karatsuba, where we don't, even though it's a recursive algorithm, we don't require um, increasing memory, but uh, a constant uh, uh, memory overhead. And we generate the elements of the public matrix on the fly instead of generating the full public matrix, which would require uh, high memory. Um, as for Tumcook, um, as I said, Tumcook can be seen as uh, breaking down um, multiplication, a large multiplication into uh, smaller multiplications. In this case, Tumcook 4 will break down the 256 coefficient polynomial multiplication of Saber into seven uh, 64 coefficient polynomial multiplication. And for doing that, we first split the two operands A and B into four, and then we use this uh, these four parts of the original polynomial to uh, build these seven um, uh, intermediate polynomials. And uh, we perform the multiplication uh, with the smaller dimension, and then we perform interpolation, which is the reverse of this transformation. And uh, here, uh, what we realize is that um, this um, evaluation step requires a, a lot of accesses to this um, A polynomial, but many of these accesses are repeated so we proposed a change of the algorithm and instead of uh, accessing A and B and build the seven um, intermediate uh, polynomials sequentially, we use a vertical memory access and uh, we build uh, these seven polynomials uh, simultaneously in parallel at the expense of a, a higher memory consumption. And the same principle can be applied in interpolation to read the uh, data from the seven, uh, seven intermediate results um, simultaneously. So if we look at this uh, in the uh, algorithm version, we can compare here the horizontal version. And we can see that, for instance, in the horizontal version, A3 would be accessed uh, here once, two, three, four, five, six times, or A1 would be accessed also uh, five times. Whereas here, they are accessed only once, and then they are used and combined to, um, to generate um, the, seven, the seven small polynomials. And also the operations to, to gen generate the seven small polynomials can be somehow combined to uh, gain some efficiency. And uh, then uh, similarly, we do for Karatsuba and at low level for the school book um, optimization is where we take advantage of the hardware platform of the DSP instructions. And uh, 
Um, in particular, we take advantage of the multiply and accumulate instructions and another instruction which is supported by ARM, which is the double multiply and accumulate, uh, where we can uh, get uh, four uh, results uh, instead of only two. So for the multiply and accumulate, we would have um, the coefficients accommodated in registers in half words. So we can operate in half words uh, without having the carry propagation between two half words. That's a feature supported by the DSP instructions. So we can accommodate two coefficients per register. And then with the multiply and accumulate, we can perform uh, this uh, cross products and with the double multiply and accumulate we can perform uh, this double product so uh, cross uh, parallel cross products here that are added and we then as switch um, the half words uh, to arrange uh, this and to perform also the half product and addition um, and then for the cortex m0 and um, implementation, we perform the memory optimizations. The first memory optimization was uh, to um, bookkeep the randomness because uh, the elements of the matrix are generated sequentially. And that means that uh, we use the output of this check function to generate the nine polynomials. So when we want to generate the polynomials one by one, uh, we need to uh, take care of the leftover randomness. Uh, because we don't want to break compatibility between several implementations. And uh, we use um, a buffer uh, to store this leftover randomness. And then uh, we just perform calls to Ketchak squeeze, which is uh, um, the round function of Ketchak, uh, which is used for shake, uh, uh, ex for the extendable output function. And uh, we use this randomness to generate the uh, coefficients. And once we run out of randomness, we just um, ship this in the buffer and perform a new call to get some. And this way we can uh, generate polynomial by polynomial all the elements of the public matrix. Uh, for the memory efficient of Karatsuba, as I said, uh, we use a, a, a variant of Karatsuba where we require um, um, some extra memory, but it's fixed extra memory. Uh, between recursive calls and the way we do it is because we perform some arrangements uh, in memory uh, so that we have um, the two operands uh, f and g f is uh, broken down into two and uh, these f and g are read only spaces and then h is the where the result will be but it's a write space and uh, we are constantly moving and uh, uh, storing in h uh, so of course this has a small overhead in performance, but uh, we can we can implement Karatsuba without uh, extra memory, as we did uh, using four uh, recursions of Karatsuba, and in the, one of these recursions we unroll it also to merge some of these arrangements because some of the, these arrangements were redundant when performing multiple recursive calls. And uh, finally, uh, the, the last of the memory optimizations we introduce uh, as um, in Saber, we have the public matrix A, but actually the public matrix A as used in key generation and encryption is the same matrix but tram transposed. And this matrix is generated in row major order. So that means uh, for the key generation, it was generated um, uh, consecutively for, for the row and then we could perform the row product. Uh, but for the encryption, uh, we had the transpose version, so it was uh, generated in column major order, so we would perform uh, the multiplication in row column order, so we would need extra memory. And what we did is we, we proposed to swap the matrix between key generation and encryption, and we initially called this a saber sharp, uh, but later on uh, this proposal was adopted by Saber team in the second round of NIST competition. And uh, because um, encryption is a more critical operation for, for Internet of Things applications, so for research constraints devices um, where we have to perform a lot of encryptions, but key generation is not performed that often, uh, or it's performed by the gateway, which has larger capabilities. Uh, then uh, the next paper I want to introduce is the, the um, 
hardware software implementation of Saber. Uh, this was the embedded implementation. And now we go to the um, hardware implementation. And uh, this was published in, in DAC 2020. Uh, it was a joint work with um, Furkan and Schumann, Suyo and Ingrid. And uh, the title of the paper is Compact Domain Specific Coprocessor for Accelerating Module Lattice Based Skin Capsulation Mechanism. And what we do is we use a hardware software approach to perform uh, ping pong computation between the hashing, between the random number generation and the arithmetic operations. And only the arithmetic operations are implemented in hardware. So while we perform the arithmetic operations in hardware, we are uh, performing the hashing and the random number generation in software. Um, and then um, the, the main focus of this work was the design of the of the polynomial multiplier of the hardware. And for this polynomial multiplier, we chose a Tumcook uh, algorithm, which was uh, the first time that was implemented in, in uh, hardware. Uh, and we did that to exploit the parallelism of these seven intermediate uh, polynomials uh, to perform these, these seven multiplications in parallel. And, uh, for that, we also require a custom memory layout. So if we go to the um, um, system overview of, of this coprocessor, as I said, we have the software domain where operations uh, like hashing, rounding, all the operations of the crypto system are performed. And then the arithmetic is performed in the hardware. So what we have is what we, we have to transmit the polynomials to the hardware. They are stored in the, the VRAM, in the uh, memory and we perform we, we have an interface uh, common interface which is very efficient the, the overhead is actually negligible as compared to the execution time of uh, the multiplication itself or the data transfers and uh, we perform the the evaluation of Tumcook then we perform the same multiplications in parallel and then we perform the depolation. So a requirement for this multiplier and this 64 coefficient multiplier is that it is very compact because we are going to instantiate um, uh, seven in parallel. And also there are some requirements on the memory of the VRAM uh, because we want to run the evaluation to generate the seven uh, polynomials um, at once. So let's first introduce the memory layout. Uh, as if you remember from uh, the previous slides when I explained Tumcook, that we generate these seven uh, intermediate polynomials by accessing A, uh, offset with uh, 0, 64, 120, and 192, which means uh, if A was a 256 coefficient polynomial, we are breaking down in four uh, and we have to access this. So um, if we want to uh, read four coefficients at a time for running the evaluation, we need to um, read the coefficients with uh, an offset of 64. So we need to um, store the coefficients, not uh, with the coefficients in sequential order, but with the 64 offset. So um, the, the memory would look like this. Uh, we have the first operand A, and uh, the um, horizontal uh, is a word of memory, and then vertically we are um, increasing the addresses of the memory. So in the first address, we have a word uh, that is composed by these four coefficients. Each coefficient is uh, uh, 13 bits for the modulus of Saber, uh, which we can consider 16 bits and times four is 64 bit, which is a very standard word size for a memory. And uh, similarly, we have um, um, the polynomial B and then the result will be written in the same way so that if we need to access the result for further operations, we can keep on the same uh, uh, memory pattern. We can keep on the same uh, access pattern. Uh, and then um, the other critical component of the hardware design, as I said, was the 64 coefficient polynomial multiplier. And for the 64 coefficient polynomial multiplier, what we did was to use um, distributed memory, which is LUT based memory, which is very efficient in the FPGA because also the length of this coefficient, the, the length of this um, polynomial is 64, and the uh, size of the LUTs in the FPGAs is uh, 64 bit. So that means with um, with one LUT, we could store one polynomial of one bit per coefficient and combining uh, 13 LUTs, we can store um, a polynomial 
uh, of 64 coefficient with 13 bit per coefficient, which is uh, the case of Saber. So we have these three memories, A, B, and C. Uh, a and B for the operands, they are uh, read only memories uh, and uh, read only for the multiplier. Of course, they are preloaded uh, with the operands. And then C is a memory that uh, where we read and write from it. And uh, also, we use um, the pipeline in, in, in this architecture. We use it only in the multiplier. We cannot pipeline the um, accumulation uh, part because we need to keep the data flow uh, within one clock cycle when we need to sweep the result. And um, for performing the multiplication, we would first load the four coefficients of B and then perform the multiplication for 64 coefficients of A, then load the next four coefficients of B and again iterate over the entire A. Uh, whereas the right, right operations are only the operations from this register. If we write the output of this register in every clock cycle, uh, at the end of the, um, of the full operation, we would have the result in C. And, um, um, and different considerations that can be done in this module is that we could use more multipliers or less multipliers, um, depending on whether we have a smaller area or a higher performance. But what we found for um, our design was that four was um, the optimal number to get a, a, a performance of a full multiplication, which was comparable to the performance of an entity. Because uh, when we are talking about lattice-based cryptography, and about Saber in particular, uh, we are comparing its efficiency to Kyber. So we are comparing the efficiency of a scheme that is based on uh, power of two moduli with a scheme that is based on prime moduli, a scheme that can use the entity with a scheme that uses the entity. And uh, the goal is to, to make them, uh, well, in, in this case, to make Saber more efficient, but uh, comparable in efficiency. Because of course, when we talk about hardware, we have, always uh, a certain degree of flexibility on whether we have higher performance or we have a uh, more compact area. And um, then uh, lastly, I'm going to introduce uh, the uh, a third paper on, on optimizing Tumpuk multiplication in this case, and of course applied to Saber, but in this case it's Tumpuk multiplication more in general. We published it in uh, CHESS 2020. It was a joint work with uh, Anshuman and Ingrid, and the title is Time Memory Trade-off in Tomb Multiplication and Application to Module Lattice-Based Cryptography. And in this paper, we formalize a uh, Tomb Cook algorithm, not as a recursive algorithm, but uh, also what I was mentioned of the, um, as a uh, chain of domain um, method. And then we propose uh, two optimizations to this algorithm uh, when we are working with module lattices. One is pre-computation and the other one is lazy interpolation. And we implemented these optimizations in a wide range of platforms, uh, desktop computers, high performance uh, platforms, uh, AVX Intel processors, and also embedded platforms, context and form. And we also propose in this paper some additional memory optimizations to Saber. Uh, so first of all, let's go into uh, the Tunkuk multiplication. So Tunkuk multiplication, as I said, has a first stage where we perform the evaluation of the operands uh, to go to the intermediate uh, polynomials. In this case, we perform the evaluation of Tunkuk and Karatsuba, and uh, we do the same for, for the other operand B, and then we perform the point value multiplication. And uh, if we want to get the result, we should perform here the interpolation, uh, and then we get the, the result of A times B. But in modulatis, uh, we have uh, to perform the row column product. We have to perform a matrix vector multiplication. We are not performing single multiplications, but we are accumulating this multiplication with other multiplications to get the row column products. And uh, we can take advantage of this to, to work on the point value domain and perform the population only once for each uh, row column multiplication. Uh, and the, this is the, the first improvement, uh, the first optimization, which was the lazy interpolation. And um, in this lazy interpolation, uh, as I mentioned, uh, consists of working only on uh, the point value domain and performing the interpolation only once at the end. Uh, and uh, if we implement this, um, we can take a look at the four dimension three. We have to 
one uh, multiplication, the second one, third one, they are all accumulated in the um, point value domain. And then at the end, we perform the interpolation step to recover the result. And the other, um, the optimization has to do with the fact that one of the operands in lattice based cryptography is the secret and the secret is fixed. So we can perform the evaluation of the secret. We can store the secrets in the point value domain. And also we will see later on because uh, we also optimize the memory for the secret because the secret coefficients are smaller. They don't have 13 bits, but they have only four bits. So uh, this uh, memory overhead can be mitigated as well. And uh, we can perform uh, yeah, and we can perform the evaluation only once and, and this can be used to skip uh, these um, evaluations uh, two out of three times that they had to be performed before. And then of course we can combine these two optimizations, the least interpolation and the pre-computation. And uh, uh, we can see here uh, if we perform this interpolation and pre-computation since the uh, operand B, which is the secret, is pre-computed, we need to perform this evaluation. We only perform the evaluation of the polynomials A of the public matrix that are generated on the fly. We perform the uh, multiplication and we are accumulating them in the point value domain. And only in the end, we, we uh, perform the interpolation and we recover the result. And this uh, optimization was a, an algorithmic optimization. so. It was uh, more of a theoretical optimization, but it has different implications. Uh, we can see here the, the complexity of these optimizations, how, how we improve the complexity of uh, the uh, of the polynomial multiplication using Tungpuk in terms of the number of evaluation and interpolation operations that have to be performed. And we can see that uh, when we don't use our optimizations, and when we use optim or optimizations, the number of um, uh, operations that have to be performed during um, evaluation is half. Uh, and the um, number of interpolations, of course, is, um, is reduced by L. L is the dimension of the matrix. So it's a square root of it. Uh, if the dimension of the matrix is three uh, for, for Saber, we only have to perform uh, now one interpolation per row product, so three in total. So, but if this is, um, if it's five Saber, the high security version of Saber, where L is four, we would go from performing uh, 16 interpolations to only four. Um, and of course, this this um, lazy interpolation and pre-computation can be applied to software implementation and also to hardware implementations. And we implemented it on software on the AVX implementation. Uh, in the AVS, AVX implementation, uh, we introduce uh, the concept of lazy transposition, not only lazy interpolation, but lazy transposition, because um, uh, how AVX works is uh, that we have a um, big uh, vectoral register where we can store the full uh, polynomial for the 16 bit, 16 coefficient. Uh, um, um, school books multiplications and then when we want to perform the interpolation we have to transpose the result in order to perform the interpolation and what we do when we use the lazy interpolation is that we keep the result in these vector registers so we perform the interpolation only once but also this transposition of the full um, AVX register is performed only once what are the implications of the on the cortex and for implementation on the embedded implementations are different because here we had this very optimized uh, schoolbook routine but here we need to perform an, not the schoolbook but the um, accumulative version of the schoolbook so we need to preload uh, the the values of the um, the result to um, accumulate um, so instead of performing the, we can see here that this, this instruction, which was the unsigned multiplication, becomes the uh, multiply and accumulate instruction because we are not only multiplying but accumulating with uh, these preloaded results. And this introduces a certain overhead in, in terms of performance as well. So, uh, yeah, we, you can check the results on our paper, but the, the conclusion was that. Um, for smaller dimensions, for uh, the lightweight version of Saber, the lazy interpolation is not worth 
uh, the extra cost in memory. <coughs> but um, if you want a high performance implementation for, for Saber or for Fire Saber, you can get um, improvements up to 10 or, um, or 30% uh, for Fire Saber in the polynomial multiplication, in the matrix vector multiplication. Uh, and then what I mentioned about the secrets, the secrets um, in, in Saber implementations, they were considered as polynomials as any other element in Saber. But um, the secrets are a sample from a binomial distribution. This binomial distribution has um, uh, the variance uh, uh, mu. And uh, for Saber, the worst case between Fire Saber, Saber and Light Saber is for Saber m equals to five. And for m equals to five, the samples of this uh, binomial distribution have only four bits per coefficient. So we don't need to store um, the secrets as um, polynomials of 256 coefficients with 13 bits per coefficient, but we can store the secrets using only four bits per coefficient. And uh, this has a big impact in the um, memory requirements for storing the secret. Um, and the compression of the secret uh, goes up to uh, 36, 38%. But it also improves a lot uh, the, um, the unpack functions because re it reduces the, the complexity of the pack and unpack functions. Because when we have to pack, uh, when we are performing operations, we are considering polynomials as arrays where each element of the array is a coefficient of the polynomial. Uh, and, but uh, when we want to uh, store these polynomials or uh, send them over the network, we pack them uh, efficiently, we, we pack them uh, as a bit string. And uh, of course, packing 13 bits into bytes requires a lot of sheet operation, shift operations, whereas the pack from four bits is uh, straightforward. Uh, so yeah, I introduced these, these three papers and I would have liked to talk a bit more about uh, other works, but um, they are currently under review process and I didn't want to break the anonymity. So I will finish with some conclusions and then we can discuss and we can see if there were any questions during the talk. Um, the three conclusions, conclusions that I, I want to highlight from this talk is the first of all, uh, that having a feedback loop between designers and implemented is key for uh, a successful design of cryptographic schemes, is key for uh, having more efficient schemes uh, but also when it comes to a competition such as this competition, it's also key for uh, having a winning solution. In this case, we don't know if Saber will win yet, but uh, we arrived to the final among uh, more than 60 or 70 uh, initial candidates. And uh, I'm really convinced it was thanks to this feedback between uh, uh, theoretical uh, cryptographers and uh, cryptographic engineers. Uh, and uh, in the past, we already saw the same case for, for AES, for instance, that was also designed uh, at COSIC. Uh, and they also followed a similar process uh, to have uh, where they had um, implementers in touch with the designers. Then <clears throat> when we talk about optimizations, um, it is very important um, um, to take uh, um, into account that the optimizations are very often platform dependent uh, and different schemes and different uh, theoretical optimizations will adapt better to one platforms or another uh, to software implementation or hardware implementations. But even in software implementation, we saw it for the lazy interpolation. Uh, they get, uh, uh, they are much better in, in AVX than in embedded implementations. So having flexible schemes uh, is always um, um, an advantage um, and this is also why uh, module lattice-based lattice schemes are the preferred solution among lattice-based schemes. And if we remember the table of the nice, nice uh, finalists, um, there were three out of four camps were lattice-based uh, solutions, but two out of four, uh, which are Saber and Kyber, are module lattice-based schemes. And uh, similar thing happens in, um, in signatures where uh, one of the three finalists is uh, deleting is also a module lattice-based uh, solution. 
And this gives us also the, the third conclusion, which is that the module lattice constructions are uh, the most um, efficient solution for uh, lattice-based cryptography because um, uh, ring, uh, ring um, variants are more efficient, are, are faster, but they have um, they don't have such a um, um, trust in as module lattice solutions in their security. And um, finally, the the future work or the open research lines. Um, I already talk about um, research on uh, uh, random number generation constructions and on Gaussian samplers and how to mask sampling. But um, we can we can also uh, see that uh, security aspects in general are. Um, an open research field, and by security aspects, I mean um, security against physical attacks. I talk here about how to make uh, multiplication more efficient, about how to say, make cyber more efficient, or we could also look at different algorithms for making the Gaussian sample more efficient, the pseudo number generation more efficient, but uh, we don't care only about efficiency, but about security. And, um, we want to make these operations secure against side channel attacks. We want to make them constant time. Uh, so this is an open field of research that will we have to follow, um, of course, the, the research on implementations. And that will be also taken into account by NIST. They already announced that for the decision of the winner of the NIST post-quantum cryptography standardization contest, they will value also um, these aspects. Then, um, of course, um, more research on, on hardware architectures. Uh, due to the hardware flexibility, uh, we can have uh, we can com have completely different architectures, and, and we have to see whether this gives an advantage in terms of performance, in, in terms of area. Uh, I implemented Saber using a Tunguk multiplier, but in the literature we can see um, papers uh, using um, systolic array like multiplier or using Karatsuba, and also uh, we have FPA implementations, but we could uh, move into ASIC implementations, not only for Saber, also for the other finalists. Uh, and um, the third point, the last point is, um, I talked about lattice-based cryptography, and as I said lattice -based, at the very beginning, lattice-based cryptography goes beyond uh, key encapsulation mechanisms and digital signatures. Um, we can build a lot of uh, novel primitives with um, lattice, uh, lattices, and we can use lattices for uh, homomorphic encryption, for um, functional encryption, for uh, multi-party computation. And there is already mm, uh, quite some research on how to build schemes for these primitives, but uh, there, are, there is not so much research on how to implement these schemes efficiently. And I think this is also a very interesting uh, research area. So uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. And now um, we can move to, to the question and answer uh, time. OK. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, see the questions. Otherwise, I can, I can read them. Um, yeah, I think I can go to the chat. OK. Um, yeah, um, so the first, um, yeah, the first um, question uh, by Victor Mateo. Uh, yeah, we are aware of the very recent publication of the, of the how entity can be used for uh, unfriendly rings. Uh, what uh, this means for, for people in the audience that is maybe not familiar um, with uh, with this area of research or, or with the, the uh, literature. Um, as I said, the, the entity um, requires um, uh, modular arithmetic with a prime modulus. Uh, and um, when we have Saber, for instance, that we have a power of two modulus, we cannot use entity. But um, this is not entirely true because it was um, published in, in this paper that Victor is mentioning. Um, uh, they choose a prime such that which is big enough, big enough for uh, the arithmetic not to overflow it. So they perform uh, all the arithmetic model this prime, 
And then uh, when they get the result, they can uh, reduce the result modulo the prime of, uh, of Saber. And then the authors of this paper, they demonstrated that um, this solution uh, can be as efficient as Tumcook when uh, using Saber. Um, I, of course, I, I did not mention that in, in my papers because they were published before, but um, in future works that will, um, will implement Saber, of course, the, this comparison is needed. And, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the drawback of, of this method is that it has a, a big memory overhead as well. But uh, in terms of performance, it achieves even faster performance than, than Saber. And also uh, another drawback is when it comes to the mask implementation, there is already some ongoing work in uh, masking Saber. And uh, masking the entity is harder than masking Tumcook uh, because, um, because of the nature of masking, you can have arithmetic masking, Boolean masking, uh, you, can, you have to mask um, numbers modulo a prime, whereas when you have a power of two uh, modulus, you are masking, uh, masking a set of bits. And if, if your modulus is two to the power of 13, that means all your numbers are 13 bits, whereas for the prime, uh, this is not true. Uh, you don't have the full range. Um, I don't know if this answers uh, Victor's question, so you can, uh, you can uh, let me know uh, in the chat. Uh, the next question was by uh, Mukul Kulkarni. Um, the question was, um, this question is for the discussion after the talk. Um, can you elaborate uh, on why module variants are believed to be more secure than the ring variant? And there are some class classes of attacks which work better for rings than modules. Uh, yeah, um, so there are certain attacks that um, work better not with, um, it's not a matter of module or ring, but it's a matter of the underlying uh, lattice uh, problem. So uh, when, when we talk about lattice-based cryptography is because we have um, a construction, uh, uh, a scheme, um, which has, which uh, performs these operations like sampling, the, sampling an element, a polynomial, sampling a secret, then performing the convolution. And then when we want to retrieve this secret, that means to theoretically break the, uh, the scheme, what we do <clears throat> is that um, we perform the, the best possible attack. And the best possible attack is to model the problem as a lattice problem and then perform lattice reduction mm -hmm. algorithms. Uh, and uh, there are lattice reduction algorithms that uh, take advantage of lattices having certain structure. Uh, so in, in ring uh, learning with errors, we have uh, what we call ideal lattices. This, these are uh, lattices which have a particular uh, structure, and um, this is something that it has not it has not been um, uh, formally proven, but it is um, consensus in the cryptographic community that um, uh, so as as often happens in cryptography, uh, the security is also a matter of trust, and uh, yeah, the consensus is that um, module lattices are are more secure than than ring lattices. Um, yeah, again, uh, if this answer your question, uh, let me know in the chat. Uh, next question is by uh, Nitin. Um, um, thank you, Nitin. Uh, um, the question is about um, in, whether, in my opinion, selecting Tumkuk or Karatsuba instead of Strassen, and under what conditions they can outperform each other. Um, I'm not familiar with Strassen because I'm not sure now if it's uh, one of the variants of the entity or uh, um, I don't know if you can clarify on that, but um, we have an ongoing work now where we actually show um, better uh, algorithm, better way to uh, implement Tumkuk and Karatsuba, so a better way to split the polynomials uh, recursively without uh, any condition on the on the um, uh, on the parameters of the scheme. Uh, and um, yeah, and uh, we are going to outperform uh, Tumkuk and Karatsuba. Not only outperform, we are going to 
improve uh, substantially the memory overhead that they introduce. And we are going to get uh, um, for certain architecture closer to, to uh, the entity. Uh, but um, yeah, this is still an ongoing work. Uh, <clears throat> and then there is a question by uh, Bohan Jan. Uh, he's asking about the security impact uh, on uh, of using uh, non-strong pseudo-random numbers and why implementators uh, prefer uh, pseudo-random number generator over uh, true random number generators. Well, uh, uh, of course, the preference between uh, pseudo-random number generators over uh, true random number generators is a matter of efficiency. Um, it is more efficient, it is faster to generate pseudo-random numbers uh, than uh, true random numbers. And uh, um, then uh, we use the true random number generator to, to sample the seed, to sample what is our, our entropy, um, which is typically a seed of uh, 256 bits for achieving a security level of uh, 128 bit of post-quantum security. And then we expand this seed to generate uh, the public matrix, the secret element, or the errors when we sample the errors. Um, as for the first question, which was uh, about the security impact, um, well, actually, uh, right now, um, um, the people is always, like the cryptographic community tends to use uh, Ketchak-based solutions because um, we are in the context of the NIST competition and Ketchak is also an NIST standard. It's also a post-quantum secure standard. And um, it's kind of a, um, a standard procedure when designing the scheme. But there have been already teams, actually, I think um, most of the finalists that propose uh, alternative constructions. There, is alterna there are alternative constructions of Saber and Kyber, where um, the pseudorandom number generation is based on AES constructions rather than Ketchak, and they are proven to be more efficient. Uh, but um, this is an, an area that has not been explored, uh, partly because of what I said of the, um, the context of the NIST contest, uh, but also because um, if you change the um, uh, pseudo-random number generator from a Ketchak-based one to an AES-based one, uh, you, can, you can really perform this change in, in Saber, but also in Kyber, in Entrue. So it's a change that will not affect the performance, so to speak. Like it will affect it, but it will affect all schemes equally. So when it comes to the comparison between schemes, this is not uh, this is not um, a key point. This is not uh, something critical for for the design of the scheme. We, you can compare which scheme performs better or is more efficient um, because of their parameters, because of their constructions, and because of um, how you implement all other operations, because this operation will be implemented equally for, for different schemes. Um, but this is an open research area because um, I think to the best of my knowledge, there are no, no uh, published uh, works on, on whether you can use um, non-strong set random numbers for the public matrix, for instance, uh, because the public matrix, um, the requirements you have is only non-invertibility, so you, you don't want to, uh, you don't want an attacker to craft a public matrix, so you don't want an attacker to have um, um, constructions that allows him to um, give a seed that will generate the public matrix they they want. Uh, but um, yeah, but no one has research on it. On, no one has proposed alternative constructions with these non-strong assumptions. 